Well, if you have your Bible, then I would invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. First John chapter 5, I will begin by reading from verse 1. So, brothers and sisters, this is God's holy word. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, have you heard of the names Bill Bowerman and Phil Knight? Uh, Bill Bowerman was the track and field coach at the University of Oregon, and his student, Phil Knight, was his athletic runner. And in 1964, Bill Bowerman and Phil Knight founded an American sportswear company in Oregon known as Blue Ribbon Sports. They opened their first retail outlet in 1966, and in 19, uh, later on in 1972, they launched a shoe brand known famously as Nike. And the whole company had a makeover and renamed itself in 1978. Now, I think all of you are quite familiar with Nike, and perhaps some of you are very familiar with the slogan, just do it. But, but do you know the name of its logo that looks like a check mark, if this thing works? But do you know the name of its logo that looks like a check mark, like right here on the screen? It is called Swoosh. And Swoosh is the logo of Nike, and apparently just that logo alone is worth $26 billion. And the reason why I began with the brand Nike is because John, the Apostle John, uses this word in this passage. No, John did not have the Nike shoes in mind. In fact, you cannot find this word in the English translation. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, the words that I want to hone in on are overcomes and victory. Overcome is nikao in the Greek, and it is in the verb tense. And this word can also be translated as to conquer, to vanquish, or to defeat. And the ancient Greeks, uh, and also the name, the noun for nikao is nike, which is translated as victory. So that's where we get our word Nike. And the ancient Greeks worshiped a goddess named Nike. Uh, she is the, known as the goddess of victory or the goddess of triumph. And the Greeks believed that humans cannot achieve victory besides the gods. And only the gods were ultimately unconquerable. So it does carry a sense of winning a contest or in a military conquest. So in light of Thanksgiving weekend, I thought about titling this morning's message, Thank God for Nike. Now, I'm not trying to be cheeky, but I do want to confess that I am wearing a pair of Nike shoes this morning just to show my gratitude to God for Nike. But I digressed. As we begin looking at the final chapter of 1 John, John's train of thought in this passage is actually not easy to outline or to follow because he seems to be intertwining many different ideas that we have already learned thus far, such as being born of God, loving God, loving one another, and keeping his commandments. Uh, what seems to be John's main theme or the main point here? John Stott thinks that in this passage, faith, love, and obedience are the natural growth which follows a birth from above. Some think that it is a continuation of a love theme from the previous passage. Daniel Aiken argues that faith is the primary topic of this passage, 
which could be the case. And if you hear this passage preached by different pastors, they might highlight one idea more than the other. And so the idea that I do want to explore further is overcoming the world. And so I titled this message, Who is it that overcomes the world? That's the question we want to answer this morning. But what does it mean to overcome the world? Or to conquer the world? See, the word overcome, nikao, is mentioned a few times in this letter. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 13 to 14, John talks to the young men who have overcome the evil one. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, John talks about how true believers overcome the spirit of the Antichrist or the false prophets. So you see, the false prophets are out in the world spreading lies and spreading deceits, but believers who are led by the spirit of truth will ultimately overcome them by not buying into their false teachings. John particularly uses this word 17 times in the book of Revelation, where Jesus says, for instance, that to the seven churches, the one who conquers. And then he inserts a promise to those who are conquerors or overcomers. And when John talks about the world here, he is speaking particularly about the wicked system or the values of this world that are in direct opposition against God. We're reminded in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, that we are not to love the world or the things in the world. See, the world is dead to us as believers, and we are dead to the world. The world does not know us as true believers because they don't know Jesus Christ. And the world has false prophets, and the world listens to the false prophets. And Satan himself, he is the God and the ruler of this world. And he's using this world to constantly tempt us and to lure us away from, our, from the living God. And the world is always trying to overcome us and try to conquer us and want us to conform to its systems and values. And so it may be a scary world that we're living in because it is trying to attack us spiritually or maybe sometimes physically due to persecution. But we should not be afraid of it. As true believers, we should be the, most, the boldest and the most courageous people in the world. John gives us an assurance that we can overcome the world and to stand firm with confidence to renounce ungodliness. And so let's go back to the question, who is it that overcomes the world? Who can do such a thing? Well, John gives us an answer to this question in verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, okay, that was easy. <laughs> A typical Sunday school answer. We can just end the sermon right here and go home. But there is more to it than just this simple answer. I think, this, I think that this passage has logical connections from one idea to another idea that ultimately explains why a believer who believes that Jesus is the Son of God can overcome the world and how this believer can overcome this world. And so the first point I want to make is this. Who is it that overcomes the world? The one who has faith. And the object of our faith is in Jesus as the Christ and Jesus as the Son of God. John begins verse 1 with faith. And he ends this section in verse 5 with faith. It functions like a sandwich. And in verse 1, it is John's third time using this word belief, to believe in reference to faith in Jesus Christ. But it is this passage alone in the final chapter of 1 John that John elaborates on faith more than any other passages in 1 John. So let's talk about faith. I think there can be a lot of misunderstandings of what faith is. If, you, if I were to ask you these questions, then how would you answer them? What is faith? What does it mean to have faith? How do you know that you truly have faith? Uh, some might throw that word around without really thinking about it. Uh, Kamala Harris, she's running for the candidate, uh, candidacy for the vice presidency. 
She says that she's a person of faith, whatever that means. And you ask a regular church goer, and this person may respond, well, I have faith in God. And when you press them deeper and ask them, uh, what do you mean by that? And they might respond to you, well, I believe in God. I go to church. I do all these religious activities. Uh, Sometimes they might perceive faith as merely knowing facts about God or maybe just knowing facts about the Bible. Uh, Some might just understand faith as agreeing with God or agreeing what the Bible says. However, I don't think that's what true faith is. It's not merely an intellectual faith where you just know facts. It's not just merely believing too. You see, James, in the letter of James, he says to us, well, good for you that if you have faith that God is one. Well, guess what? Even the demons believe too, and they shudder. So it's not just merely just believing and then that's it. So what does, exactly does it mean to believe? What does it mean to have faith? Well, the, well, the word faith is in the noun. The verb for faith is to believe. And this idea contains, this word contains the idea of trust, commitment, fidelity, assurance, faithfulness, confidence, and reliability. Now, I like to use this illustration a lot when I teach on the topic of faith. Uh, Just think of a stool or think of a chair. Uh, What is the chair made for? Well, the chair is made for sitting and to support your weight as you are sitting. But here's the question. How do you know that you truly believe that the chair will do what it is exactly made to do? Do you just say, oh, okay, there's a chair here. I believe that this chair will support me. And that's it. Well, you can say that you believe all you want, but you've got to act on your faith, meaning you've got to learn to trust the chair by sitting on it and trust that it will support you. Not just merely just saying, I believe, and then don't do anything about it, not sit on it. So I think that's a kind of the same thing with our relationship with God. I think some Christians may just say, oh, I believe in God, but then throughout the week, they'll live their own life as practical atheists by not submitting themselves under the authority of God and in obedience to his word. So how can you know that you have genuine faith? It's by throwing yourself upon God and his word. In fact, the Bible is not like a a wooden chair or anything, but it is the rock. It is a solid foundation for our Christian life. We're to throw ourselves upon God as he has spoken to us in his word. And we're to obey his word, and not only just believe in his word, but just we ought to, we're to obey him as well. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But John's emphasis in this passage is not merely on faith, but the object of our faith. See, to overcome the world, John says in verse 5 that we are to believe or have faith that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one and only God whom the Father has sent. He is the God-man who shares the same divine nature as his Father. And even going back to verse 1, We are to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the chosen one, the anointed one, the Messiah, whom God sent to save us from our sins. John Calvin, when he talks about faith, he comments on this, and I quote, For by faith, he, that is the Apostle John, means a real apprehension of Christ or an effectual laying hold on him by which we apply his power to ourselves. See, we overcome the world by faith because we derive strength from Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33. He said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. How do we derive strength from Jesus Christ? 
It is by abiding in him. John has been talking about this throughout this whole letter, to abide in Christ, to abide in him. And if we say we abide in Christ, then we ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. See, Jesus lived his life in perfect obedience to, his, to the will of his Father, to his loving Father. And if we are, live our lives by imitating Jesus, then we will continually overcome the world because Jesus did it. And an overcomer of the world remains faithful to the truth concerning Jesus Christ and continue to serve him. And as John says at the end of verse 4, uh, of chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, he says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So we know who it, who it is that overcomes the world. But furthermore, how does our faith in Jesus overcome the world? How does that work? Well, based on this passage, I'll try to help us understand John's train of thoughts and how he connects each idea from faith to the new birth to love and to obedience, and then circle back to overcoming the world. So how does it all work? Well, faith in Jesus is the result of the new birth. Faith in Jesus is the result of the new birth. Going back to verse 1, John says this, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. John is indicating a continual belief and faith in Jesus Christ. If you look at this verse more closely, this phrase, has been born, is one word in the Greek, and it is in the perfect passive tense. So in other words, John is not saying that our continual faith in Jesus Christ causes the new birth. Rather, it is the result of the new birth. Namely, your faith in Jesus is the evidence of the new birth, whereby God, has, God the Holy Spirit has done a supernatural work in your heart in causing you to be born again through the preaching of the gospel. And it, and it is this miracle of the new birth that positions us in a permanent relationship with God, with a, of our triune God. And because we have been born again, we have been granted to have faith and to have continual faith in Christ, to have continual trust and confidence in him every single day. And without the new birth, we cannot possibly have faith because faith in Jesus is a gift given to us by God. And John says the reason we can overcome the world is because we have been born of God. He says that at the beginning of verse 4, that everyone who, that everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. See, the truth is, is that the new birth the new birth grants us a new desire, a new heart, a new nature wrought about by the work of the Holy Spirit in transforming us from the inside out to, to love God and to enjoy God. And because we have been born of God, we are therefore adopted by God to be children of God. And as children of God, we should naturally love the Father, which is our third point. Born-again Christians should naturally love the Father. Take a look again at verse 1. Everyone, everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. This is a simple point. Our love for God should result in our love for those who are also born of God, namely the born-again Christians. Believers who have been regenerated by the Spirit of God, transformed by the Spirit of God. And we can know we can know that we truly love God when we love his children. John has been challenging us and exhorting us to love each other and to love our God. This is so foundational. This is so basic and it is so fundamental to our Christian life. Now, maybe you have heard or known people in the church who just don't love the church for whatever reason. Uh, perhaps they are bitter or angry at the church, and they might have completely cut themselves off of the church family. Uh, they don't want to be bothered by the church leaders or the church members. They're tired. They're, they're done with the church. They won't ever go back to church again on Sundays. 
but they might say to you that they at least still love God. And perhaps you think, well, at least he still loves God, and I guess it's better than nothing, right? You see, they may be sincere about their love for God, but that's actually a delusional thinking. Now, I know that's a, little, a, a strong word, delusional, but it is. Because John di- disagrees with those people. Bottom line is, if that's you this morning, John is saying to you that you cannot claim to love God while you hate his children. You cannot claim to love God if you don't love his children and you have nothing to do with them because God the Father loves his children. Even Paul said that the church is the bride of Christ and Jesus is the bridegroom. You cannot say you love Jesus while you hate his bride because Jesus loves his bride whom you claim to hate. You see, if you sin against a member of the church family by not loving one another, then you are ultimately sinning against the Lord. Going back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 21, and this commandment we have from him, Whoever loves God must also love his brother. John is so clear on this. He is so clear on this. Love for God and love for his children are two sides of the same coin. We can know that we truly and biblically love God when we love his children. But John might also address this question that some might be asking in a church. Well, how can I know, how can we know that we genuinely love his children. Well, John answers that question in verse 2. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. See, John seems to be connecting ideas in a logical way. You see, your love for God should result in your love for his children. And in reverse, Your love for his children should demonstrate with evidence that you love God. Do you you see that? Your love for God should result in your love for the children of God, and in reverse, your love for the children of God should demonstrate with evidence that you love him, that you love God. But not only that, your love for God's children demonstrates with evidence that you are keeping his commandments. And when you're keeping his commandments, You show that you love God. Point 3b, we can know that we truly love God when we obey his commandments. And I think John is telling us that our love for others must be rooted and grounded in our love for God and in our obedience to his word. See, we should always address our relationship with God before we address our relationship with others. Because here's the thing. If there are problems with the root, then there, are, there will be problems with the fruit. If we are not spending time with God in his word, if we're not growing in our relationship with him, then that has tremendous effect to our lives. We start having bad attitudes. Uh, we start saying wrong things. We fall back into habitual sins. It affects how we view the world. And it effect, definitely affects our relationship with God. So let's come back to the folks who say that they, have, they want nothing to do with the church. But instead of saying that, let's just say they don't have time to obey the God. They don't have time to obey the, uh, the God's commandments. Or maybe folks who say they don't have time to read the Bible, which maybe might be the case for you this morning. And you may say to me, Ah, pastor, I'm struggling to read my Bible. I'm not praying as often as I should. I'm not serving the Lord. I don't read his word. I don't always obey him. But here's the thing. At least I still love God. I still, at least I still love him, right? That's better than nothing. How do you know that you truly love God? How do you know that you truly love God? John answers that question in verse 3. For this is the love of God. Or I would interpret this as our love for God. That we keep his commandments. John did say that 
whoever says I know him but does not keep his word is a liar and the truth is not in him. So similarly, you cannot say you love God when you're not keeping his commandments and when, and when you also don't know his word. See, when you don't read your Bible, here's the problem. How do you know his commandments? How do you obey him if you don't know his word? It doesn't matter how many times you tell me or tell other people that you love God or, I know, or that you know him if you're not living in accordance to his word during the week. Love for God and obedience to his commandments are two sides of the same coin. What's the logical connection? Jesus says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. If you love God, then that results in your obedience to him, to his commandments. And if you're keeping his commandments, then that should demonstrate your love for him. And the implications for keeping God's commandments is that you'll abide in him, know him, and have his truth live in you. So here's the question you had to ask yourself this morning. Do you love God? John has given us evidence how, of how we can know that a person is genuinely born again. They will love God. They will love his children. And they will keep his commandments. But what does this all have to do with overcoming the world? Well, overcomers of the world should not find God's commandments burdensome. So let's read verses 3 to 4. John says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now let's take a look at the word, do a little bit of word study on the word burdensome. This word burdensome is an interesting one. It can be translated as weighty, heavy, or troublesome. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this word gives us a picture of what it means. For instance, in Exodus chapter 17, verse 12, Moses' arms grew weary, weary, when he was holding his staff up while the Israelites were in battle against the Amalekites. And in Exodus chapter 18, verse 18, Moses' leadership will, will become heavy, heavy, if he doesn't delegate responsibilities to the elders of the tribes. And this word has a sense of oppressiveness or slavery. So in light of what I said about Bible reading and having trouble obeying his commandments, I acknowledge that maybe some of you do struggle genuinely. Maybe you find God's commandments burdensome. Maybe you do find it burdensome. But John says here, his commandments are not burdensome. So either he's mistaken or he's being too idealistic or he's actually speaking the truth to us. And I think he is definitely speaking the truth to us. And so what does that mean for us? Well, here's the question we ought to ask ourselves. Why is it that some find God's commandments burdensome? Why is that? If you look at, at the beginning of verse 4, the beginning of verse 4, John says, for, for, and it can be translated as because. So he's connecting that word to the last line of verse 3, which is, and his commandments are not burdensome. Well, why, why are his commandments not burdensome? And John answers that question by saying, well, it is because everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Okay, what seems to be the logical connections here? Now, initially, when I was studying this passage, I didn't understand it initially. But as I thought about it even more, I think the answer is quite simple. See, the reason why God's commandments are burdensome, or maybe some of us find God's commandments burdensome to us, is because we are not overcoming the world. Instead, we succumb to the world. We're not living out our identity of who we truly are in Christ Jesus, John is saying that born-again believers continues to overcome the world. 
and by overcoming the world and by refusing to say no to the world and all the things in this world, we should not find God's commandments burdensome. John is, not, John is saying that, he is saying that God's commandments are not crushing. They're not oppressive. They're supposed to be good for us. They're holy. They're righteous. They're good. The reason why we shouldn't view God's commandments burdensome is because as born-again Christians, we love our Lord. We are his children. He is our Father. And whatever our Father instructs us to do, we should take delight in obeying him because of our love for him. See, when you love to do something, think, about some, think, so, think of something that you, love, you really love to do. And it's hard to do. But you, but you love to do it anyways. See, when you love to do something that you enjoy, even though it's difficult, you do not find it burdensome. See, difficulties and burdensome are not necessarily equivalent. Following Jesus is never meant to be easy. Rather, it is difficult due to persecution and also because of wor the world trying to tempt us. But you do it. You joyfully do it because you love him and what he has done for you. You can enjoy and love to do difficult things and yet still not find them to be burdensome. For instance, when Alethea was born, Allison and I had to stay up late to take care of a crying baby and poopy diapers and other things to, to care for her. And my love for her overrides the, my feelings of burdensome. Was it difficult? And is it difficult? Of course it is. It is difficult. But is it burdensome? Is it slavishly burdensome? N nope, not at all. Not at all. It's kind of like that in our, with our relationship with God. Our love for God should override any kind of burdensome towards his commandments. And instead, we should obey him joyfully. For instance, if, when you read the book of Psalms, there's a longest chapter called Psalm 119. The psalmist repeatedly expresses his delight in God's law. He says in verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. Verse 16, I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Verse 24, your testimonies are all, also are my delight. They are my counselors. Verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That's what the psalmist says. He doesn't find God's word to be burdensome. He takes delight. He joyfully obeys. He loves the law. And listen to, listen to William Barclay's remark on this verse. He says this, and I quote, For love... No duty is too hard and no task is too great. That which we would never do for a stranger, we will willingly attempt for a loved one. That which we would never give to a stranger, we will gladly give to a loved one. That which will be an impossible sacrifice if a stranger demanded it becomes a willing gift when love needs it. Difficult the commandments of Christ are, burdensome they are not. For Christ never laid a commandment on a man without giving him the strength to carry it. And every commandment that is laid upon us provides us another chance to show our love. End quote. To show our love to our God. And those who love the Lord will delight to obey his commandment, to obey to his law, because they desire to glorify him and they do so out of love, not out of dread. They do so out of love because of what he has done for us and in us through Jesus Christ. And because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, the Holy Spirit causes us to be born again. That's how we can overcome the world because 
we focus on doing the will of God, we focus on obeying Him, we focus on doing whatever He says here that is countercultural, counterworldly. And by doing so, we can overcome the world and not follow the world. Now, if you admit this morning, maybe some of you do feel that God's commandments are burdensome. And if you confess this morning that you are not an overcomer of, this world, of the world, and perhaps it's time to examine your own heart. The heart of the issue is this. Why would any Christians find God's commandments burdensome at all? Why, does, why do we find this to be so hard to read? Or, of course, it's hard to read, but why do we find it to be hard, burdensome to read this word when it's supposed to be good for us? When it's supposed to liberate us from sins? When it's supposed to benefit us and others and know our God and grow deeper in our relationship with Him? Why is that? Just maybe, instead of overcoming the world, maybe we are actually, we actually deeply love the world or the things of this world. So instead of overcoming the world, do you actually love the world? Maybe your love for the world has trumped your love for God and your obedience to his commandments. Do you trust God and his word? Or are you trusting in yourself and what this world will give you? So coming back full circle to the end of verse 4, John says that this is a victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And if you do not have faith, if you do not have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and in his word, then you cannot have victory. You cannot have Nike. You cannot overcome the world if you are living by sight and not by faith. The moment you start living by sight, you're living for the moment. You're living for what you can see. You're living for your own pleasures and you're going after the world. So what's the solution here to, the, to our problem? James Montgomery Boyce gives us a very simple answer. And I quote, the solution is to return to that position in which we love God with all our hearts and souls and minds, end quote. I will even add this, too. is returning to the centrality of the gospel message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, reminding yourself of what Jesus has done for you on the cross to save you. If you have repented of your sins, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then God has called you to turn to him. God calls you to trust him daily, moment by moment. So will you trust him this morning? Will you love him this morning? Will you obey him joyfully? Will you do that this morning? If you're truly born again, if you're truly saved, then God calls you to have faith. And your faith in Jesus will overcome the world because of the new birth with a new desire to love him. And when you overcome the world, Obedience to God's commandments is not burdensome. And your obedience shows that you love God. And your love for God leads you to love others. And your love for one another demonstrates that you are truly born again. So are you born again? Are you genuinely a Christian this morning? Let me close by reading from Matthew chapter 11 verses 8, 28 to 30. It's a passage that most of us may know. Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May God's word be true in your life and may he write his eternal truth in your hearts. Let's pray. Father, create in us a new heart. O oh Lord, renew a right spirit within us. 
Uh, cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. Wherever we have sinned against you, we repent and confess them and trust that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Father, we cannot over, be overcomers of this world if we are not being faithful to you and what you have called us to do. As the psalmist took joy and delight in your law, I pray that we will have that attitude towards your word. We need your spirit to transform us from the inside out. It is a spiritual warfare that we are in because the enemy throughout this whole week is going to try to attack us and to lure us away from you. So I pray that as we begin another week, May we cling on to Christ every step of the way. May we cling on to him, not just this week, but forevermore. And we thank you for your word that reminds us and, to, and corrects us to walk in your path and not in our own path. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.